Greetings, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Greetings from Javan Jyoti Ashram on this fourth Sunday of Lent. Welcome. Thank you for joining me as you do each week in this Burning Bush Encounter series as we encounter Father, Son, and Spirit speaking to us through the Sunday Mass readings and my reflections on these readings. My reflection this Sunday is entitled, God is Love. And the context on which I base my reflection is God's love for humanity. And the theme based on the reading is God is love. The first reading, Joshua 5, 9, 8, 10 to 12, narrates a celebration of the first Passover since the Israelites left Egypt, which meant the first in 40 years. This took place on the first month of the year. Therefore, the new generation of Israelites who crossed the Jordan did so at the same time of the year that their ancestors, the Hebrew people, crossed the Red Sea during their exodus from Egypt, which you read about in Exodus 12, 2. As a practical application, the place of the Passover was Gilgal. By looking at the etymology of this word, it is similar sounding to the Hebrew word gal ati which means, I have removed. This is no coincidence, because God was now removing from them, their and the ancestors combined 40 year wandering in the wilderness since the Exodus, and finally bringing them into the promised land. God was removing the curse of their wandering that was brought on by the Israelites' disobedience and lack of faith, and bringing them into the land they can call their own a place where they would become a nation. This change in circumstances is symbolized by the ceasing of the supply of manna as a providential staple meal and the provision of produce from the land. This land was the promised land because it was the land God had promised to the ancestors. As a practical application, from this narrative, we learn that God keeps his promises, even if we cannot keep ours. God had made a promise of this land to Abraham, which you read about in Genesis 15. Despite all the reasons that the Hebrew people gave to God to change his mind and to not keep his promise, God still kept his promise. This shows us that God's love is unconditional. We do not have to do anything to deserve it. This is because God is love, which you read in 1 John 4.16. As a further practical consideration, Julian of Norwich, mystic and saint in the Catholic Church, when she had a vision of Jesus dying on the cross, asked God what this meant. She recalls in her 16 showings or visions what God said in reply. Who revealed this to you? love. What did he reveal to you? Love. Why did he reveal this to you? For love. Stay with this and you will know more of the same. You will never know anything but love without end. And this is from the showings of Julian of Norwich. Julian reassures that the suffering we cause ourselves through our sinful acts is the only punishment we will endure because God, who is all love, is incapable of wrath. We likewise learn from Julian of Norwich what God revealed to her about sin. I did not see any sin. I believe that sin has no substance, not a particle of being, and cannot be detected at all except by the pain it causes. It is only the pain that has substance for a while, and it serves to purify us and make us know ourselves and ask for mercy. Thus, while we may suffer the consequence of sin, this consequence is a result of our action. It does not come from the hand of God, because God is love and God is incapable of wrath. As a practical application. Moreover, this narrative teaches us that despite the cause of our sufferings and the length of our sufferings, God always provides us with a way out, 
but a new beginning because God removes all that stands in the way of us and him. Additionally, we learn that when God has blessed us, we must take time to give thanks. We should not take God's blessings for granted. When the Israelites celebrated the Passover in thanksgiving to God, they set a model for us. Before we even accept the blessing, before it is even granted to us, we must first give thanks. We must give thanks to God because he's not just a loving God. Out of love, God is also generous. God gives us much more than we can ever deserve. And I've tried to keep this particular standard in my life. No one ever told me this, but I have always believed that before I can even ask for something, I give thanks for it. So many times in the Catholic Church, you know, we can offer up masses. You can give a donation for masses for our intentions. Most times, I never give an intention. I always offer up a mass in thanksgiving ahead of time, telling God, thank you for you already answered my prayers, whatever that answer may be. And I do that in many different ways. It could be the masses. And that I just go before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament and I take a document. Maybe I'm submitting an application for a job or a legal document. Or maybe it could be a doctor's prescription drug. And I'm worried about taking this particular drug. Or it could be a report from the doctor. Whatever it is, I take it to the Blessed Sacrament and I lift it up and I present it to Jesus. And I say, Jesus, thank you for already taking care of this matter. You're already taking care of this. You're already blessed this particular drug that I'm about to take. You've removed everything from it that can have any side effects. You're blessing me. When I take this medication, I'm taking your precious blood. I did that when I took the vaccine for COVID. I said, Jesus, this is not Moderna I'm receiving. I'm receiving your precious blood. I'm being injected with your blood and I thank you that I'm already protected. And that is how I received my vaccines, my booster, everything. I said, this is your precious blood. We have to really believe these things. And, and when we say thanks, we really mean thanks. God, I thank you that even though I don't know how I'm going to get this job, I don't know how this door is going to open, I don't know how I'm going to function in this job or in this particular capacity, in this particular ministry, but thank you because you're the, you have already provided the way. You've already made it that way easy for me. You have opened every door, removed the obstacles. You have lit my way, Lord Jesus. And I thank you. And we have to pray that often. Every day we should be giving thanks to God. Even if it's not at the beginning of the day, but at the end of the day, thanking God, even for what you have already received. And thanking him in advance for the next day that is yet to come. Because we know by the next day, more blessings are waiting us. In the Gospel reading, Luke 15, 1 to 3, 11 to 32, this reading reveals the face of this God of love who is incapable of wrath. In this story of the prodigal son, the son who was smug enough to think that he deserved what he did not work for, an inheritance from his father, experienced firsthand the consequence of his sin of pride. As a practical application, amid his suffering, which was spiritual suffering because he used prostitutes, emotional suffering because he regretted what he had left behind, and physical suffering because he experienced hunger and hard labor, he must have recognized how inconsiderate and unwise he was. But he must have also pondered that it was better to admit that he was wrong and to continue living the life that he was. This is the same choice we all face because we are all sinners. Our sin takes us away from God. We believe that whatever we desire, whether sex, money, power, fame, or the like, 
is better, nor what we can have otherwise. So we seek after them at all costs, even if this means a detriment of family life and even more of our very soul. However, this story simultaneously reveals that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which we read in Romans 8, 38. We learn that God sees even our slightest acknowledgement of remorse, sorrow for sin, or desire for repentance. And before we can even act on these, God extends his loving arms of mercy. God is already waiting and ready to remove the distance we place between ourselves and him. And God does not stop there. God draws us close to his heart in a loving, strong embrace, kisses us and places a new garment of righteousness on us. This means that when we return to God, after we have distanced ourselves from him, God doesn't just forgive us, God welcomes us, God celebrates us, God holds us just as close and consider us just as dear as he does those who stay faithful to him. God adorns his lost sheep that are found as if they are royalty. This reveals how much God regards repentance. It is trading ego for self-surrender, imprisonment for freedom, limitations for boundless opportunities. And I experienced this, as many of us I'm sure have, in our personal lives. Living in sin is living in bondage. You don't go get anywhere with relationships, with your personal life. You don't make progress. Your prayers don't get answered. You feel like you're tied up in knots and you cannot get free. And sometimes you recognize this, sometimes you don't even recognize it. Sometimes we're so blinded in that sin that we think it's normal to be fighting with people every day. It's normal to face rejection. It's normal to have failure. It's normal to, to just go on in life living day to day, not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, and even having a faith that something good could happen. Just wallowing in misery and thinking that that is normal. It's normal to be angry all the time. It's normal to be living a life of uncertainty, a life of unhappiness, a life of constant fear, looking over our shoulders because we may have done wrong things or we expect something bad to happen at any moment because we have no faith in God. It's normal. We have all been there in one way or the other. It's bondage. Sin keeps us in bondage. We cannot get out. We're tied up. We need to pray for those chains to be broken in our lives. And Lent is a beautiful time for that. A time of repentance. There's nothing like repentance to break down walls, to break chains. Fasting also break chains. We pray more, we do more, we give more, we're more charitable. All of these are acts of faith that we do, knowing we're not doing it just because we want change broken in our lives. We want things to change. We do it out of love of God and love of neighbor. And in giving of ourselves selflessly in love of God and neighbor, everything in our life comes into place. Those chains get broken in our own. We don't know when it gets broken. We don't feel it. We just feel the freedom and we enjoy the freedom. And this is when the celebration begins. There'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Read this in Luke 15, 7. And yes, all of heaven rejoices when they see a sinner repent. When you see a sinner come back home to God, when that sin is removed, that distance between the sinner and God is removed, heaven and earth rejoices. And that is why the battle to get out of sin is so hard. Because the evil one tries everything to keep those who are in sin in bondage. But God is bigger. 
There's no loss with God. There's no defeat, only victory. No matter how strong the evil one may think he has control over any of us, he is a liar. He is a fake. He is weak compared to God. God has the ultimate power. God just waits for us to say, come, Father, I'm sorry. Save me. I'm, I'm sorry. I surrender. Come and rescue me. He just wants that little glimmer, that slight little sign of hope on our part that he is there and he can do it. And he rushes in to save us. This land that is really, truly run to God, run to him to save us. Even if we're walking with him, even if we're living righteous lives, we're not perfect. There's something in our lives you're holding on to. There's some addiction that we have that we may not even be aware of. It could just be our phones. It could just be TV. It could be social media. It could be something, anything, someone we can't do without. We pray for breaking of that bondage, for breaking of those chains. The second reading through Corinthians 5, 17 to 21, extends beyond the understanding of individual reconciliation with that of salvation, which is humanity's reconciliation with God. Salvation is available to all who accept God's grace. When we choose Christ, we choose new life. Because whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And all this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. All of humanity has been reconciled to God because of God's love, which is manifested through God's sacrificial embodiment of humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. Because of our reconciliation with God, through Jesus Christ, humanity's sin are not counted. Because for our sake, he made him to be sin who did not know sin, so that we might become the righteous of God in him. As a practical application, this is pure gift. Whether we are a prodigal son or daughter, or we are in close relationship with God, this gift of salvation is available to us. It is also available to us regardless of the good works we do. More than anything else, Jesus Christ is God's greatest and most perfect act of love. And I leave you with this prayer. Lord, I thank you for loving me more than I deserve. Amen. May God bless you this week ahead. As we reach this midpoint and we start moving towards the end of Lent, let us believe it's not too late. There's still time for repentance, fasting, charitable acts, self-giving, self-surrender. Let us make the best of what we have left of Lent. God bless you.